Thanks very much, Rish, and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to join this meeting. Um, let me get to the point where I can see my screen and, and I can start talking. Um, so I'm going to be talking about what, what I've learned so far and what we in, in, in our groups have learned so far about setting up communities and, and uh, some things that may be helpful to you in, in setting up your communities. So I'll be talking about why communities are important, the strongly felt idea, ways to look at community, what we did specifically in New York and Ithaca, and some of our rough patches. And then we'll be on to question time. So why are communities important? Well, of course we know that communities build and operate the network. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of other reasons they're important. They're a key value for attracting users to the network. Um, uh, the community with the Things Network is something that's really unique. Um, if you try to do wireless IoT using um, uh, cellular, you're you're on your own. I mean, you can talk to the phone company about uh, about getting uh, getting a, a license, but after that, you're really uh, um, pretty much you don't have a, a big group of people to fall back on. Similarly, when using Wi-Fi, um, it's a uh, it's uh, uh, you know wireless is difficult, and there aren't a lot of people who who are in a organized community to tell you um, help you figure out what to do. Communities also help us, the organizers of the of, of TTN, to keep in touch with real needs because we get feedback from people in the group. Um, they communities, and this is very important. Also, communities reassure us that there really is value to what we are doing. By, you know, it, it, not only do we get negative feedback, but we get positive feedback. And it helps us learn how to improve what we're doing organizationally. The, I, you know, I think that the, the, the biggest thing you need when you're starting a community is a strongly felt idea. Now, this is plain English for, you know, the mission statement or the, the you know, business school speak. I want to try to use words that are not corporate about this, but it's really important to have a good question about why, a good answer to the question, why am I doing this? And I have my answer. I'll offer my answer now. I've been in the business for for, for many many years, and I'm I've become disenchanted with the top-down uh, approach to uh, wireless IoT that's driven by large organizations whether the large organizations be um, uh, the three GPPs and the, the very large uh, phone companies, or whether they be large semiconductor companies. Um, because the, um, there's a mismatch between what those companies need and what the individuals who are doing uh, IoT projects need. Um, there's just many, many mismatches. I could also see the great strength of the Things Network and LoRaWAN technology for the individual practitioners. And then I also feel a very, very strongly that there's a huge value to local control and local ownership of our local data, rather than, than relying on the, the large organizations who require large economic incentives and therefore require some kind of ownership of something. Um, I wanted to, you know, I, I was very attracted to the idea of the, the grassroots organization. And finally, I personally really want to enable a wireless uh, IoT to help students learn about embedded systems, to have a, a, an inexpensive uh, system that, that schools can use to help help students um, get their feeling for what this is. Um, now, it, I, I want to say that it's it's great that your strongly felt idea be clear to others. You'll, you'll, you will, as you keep getting asked, why are you doing this, you'll, you'll get better at, at presenting it. But it's critical that the strongly felt idea be clear and compelling to you because ultimately the strongly felt idea is what's going to keep you going through the rough patches. And there will be a lot of rough patches in any organizational development, but particularly with wireless. It, it's, not, it's not always easy. Um, and the other thing about that, that strongly felt idea, uh, practically speaking, um, your your mission should be some form of service to the community, whether it's for profit, 
or not. It needs to be not just about about you. Um, and and if your strongly felt idea really ends up being about you, then that means that that you know maybe that means that 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 what you're doing there's a mismatch between what you're doing in the community, um, and and you need to look at that and see how you can align those two better. But Certainly, I mean, this is a community effort, and 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 so your efforts have to be part of that community. Um, there, there are lots of different ways to look at community. Um, you can tell that I have a degree in philosophy. I end up always doing these kinds of um, um, uh, breakdowns. First of all, there's the local community. That's what we're trying to start, um, the, the local things that we're community. But there are a lot of other local aspects. There's the global community. That you know the the Things Network uh, global organization that is you know doing the development of the key uh, back uh, backhaul technology, they're doing the promotion, they're helping us as we're starting our communities, and they're providing a global uh, forum for interaction. But there are other communities. There's your personal community. Uh, coming into the, the, the in, into all of this, there's the the personal connections that you have, the other organizations you belong to, and so forth. And there's the regional community, and the regional community is is something that sort of is in between the local and 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 the the global scale. Uh, and, but that's also very important. I think. Um, if you look at the communities that I'm organizing, I'm I'm organize, I'm initiating two communities, one in New York City and one in Ithaca. And it's it, so to give you an idea of my perspective uh, of the the uh, of how I'm looking at this, um, it's good to compare them. Um, New York City is huge. You know, I say 10 million people. I think it's actually more than that. But this is you know, orders of magnitude. Ithaca is tiny, um, 100k. Um, so uh, it, New York City is dense. Ithaca is is that the population is spread out. Um, New York City has a strong uh, Meetup.com ecosystem. Uh, Ithaca not so much. Um, uh, Ithaca, New York City has a very diverse economy. Ithaca College Town, um, it's really oriented around uh, Cornell and Ithaca College. They're the biggest employers are educational. New York City is a hard network environment, uh, difficult, um, and particularly Manhattan. But but you know much of New York City is is just difficult. Ithaca, on the other hand, is pretty easy. Um, the local area is basically flat. Uh, what's called a penny plain with with a bunch of gouges that the glaciers dug when when they came through a few. Uh, 10,000, 20,000 years ago. So um, um, you can cover it with a more agricultural, the, the, the rural figures of thumb that you see in the data sheets. Uh, culturally, New York City is much more of a, of a Slack and Twitter kind of place. Um, Ithaca is more Facebook and email. You know, So uh, you see people in, in New York City are using the Google, Google Docs and Google Tools a lot. Ithaca, not so much. It's more, you know, Windows and, and uh, Word and, and the sort of traditional stuff. So, with that in mind, let's talk about um, uh, what we did in um, in New York. First of all, well, historically, I started first in New York. I I, I saw Venki's presentation in February of this year. I immediately went out and bought a a gateway and set it up. Um, and and you know registered the gateway and, and, and to my astonishment um, ended up as the initiator of New York City. Um, um, shortly after that, I was invited by um, uh, by the Netherlands uh, consulate to exhibit at New York Tech Day. Now, one of the things I'm showing here in this chart is I'm sort of showing based on remember the, my slide of various communities. I'm sort of categorizing. Which networks, which communities are feeding into each of these actions that have led us to where we are today? So the next, the first step was personal. I did something. The next step was global. Um, the, the the Things Network um, set me up as initiator, and and the Netherlands consulate got us the booth at at, at New York Tech Day. Um, then I spent some more effort to uh, to be able to give the demo. Uh, Johan spent a, a bunch of time on me the, the night before, uh, the night before, helping me to, to get this set up, and so did Multitech. So um, the uh, there was a, a global community input, there was a personal community input. One of the reasons that Multitech 
spent a bunch of time with me is that I actually independently knew Multitech before I started all of this. So um, the, the, all community effort there. Um, from that, I had invitations to speak. And from that, I started developing the, the strong, I strongly felt idea about why the Things Network is important uh, to the local community to New York City. We had our personal, we had our organizing meeting, and uh, and and suddenly we had a, a core group. You know, it was a, a very rapid uh, transition. Part of that is because New York City has a very large population, so I was able to draw on a large population of, of technically skilled people, and and um, at that point, I, I I made the transition from being a doer to sort of being the the organizer. Um, Ithaca was different. It's a much smaller community, and maybe there, there aren't that many New Yorks around. Um, there are a lot more communities that are the size of Ithaca or larger. Um, I think there's like 250 cities like this in the United States. Um, I started with the knowledge base from having done, done it in New York. Um, my next step was to talk to my friends in Ithaca about, about what's going on. So I used my local knowledge and my personal network. I set up a meetup group. Even though meetups aren't really very active here, um, it was a uh, um, it was something that that I did anyway because it gave me a, a an easy way of doing things the same way basically save my energy, um, and we and because I had grabbed a couple of co-opted a couple of people to help me, they were also able then to use their personal context to go to go uh, to go find people. Um, so we had a preliminary meeting after which we decided on a name, set up infrastructure, GitHub, the website, this kind of stuff. And then a very key thing for Ithaca was that one of our members wrote and distributed a press release. And of course, as, as initiator, you have to be involved with that. You have to write your quote, typically. Um, uh, I, I uh, asked Vinky if he'd be willing to, to contribute a quote. And he said, sure, what would you like me to say? So I wrote his quote, and he said, sure. Okay, that's how it works with press releases. Actually, normally, you you you, uh, you sort of uh, if you, if you're the energy behind a press release, you do all the work, and and you you if you can get someone to give you a quote, great. But if you can't, you write their quote, and they say, yeah, I like it. Um, off of that, um, then then uh, um, John Bozak, who's uh, one of our members and you know, had had contacts with the local media, I got several requests for interview. We got several articles in in the local. Uh, press and local on-site online press, um, uh, and as a result, our, our our first big meeting we had uh, close to 30 people in the room. Um, uh, during that meeting, I brought in an outside speaker again using some of the using the the, the some more of a regional connection because uh, he, this was using the Montevideo group, which is a uh, which I found through the, the global stuff, or he found us through the global stuff, but uh, um, they're using 915, and so I thought that was really very relevant uh, to, to, uh, to explain to us what it was going to be like. And also, Montevideo is a lot more like Ithaca than New York City is like Ithaca. It's, it's, a, it's a medium-sized city with a, a you know, the local, the local economy outside the city is strongly agriculture-based, which matches upstate New York. So, I have some slides about you know sort of talking about the personal network. This is an attempt. This is a hope. I hope to give people who are struggling with you know how do I get beyond the the, the, the desire to start a community to, to how do I actually do it. So I'm giving you some ideas here of the, the kinds of community you already have. Even if even if the things network in your area is just just nascent, um, you still have lots of other communities that you can work with. You're, there's your personal com, uh, community. Um, there's the people you know, there's the people that they know, they're the companies that you know and who know you. Um, they're the organizations you belong to, um, and if your strongly felt idea beyond, extends beyond tech, as, as mine did, mine, mine really extends to, to, to education and, and local economic development, um, it's natural to think about your personal, local, social, religious, Non-government organization and governmental connections, and then you mine your LinkedIn. If you've got if you if you've got a LinkedIn account where you've got connections, um, if you're like me, um, uh, you don't 
you don't always make those connections unless you go, you know, use the tool and sort of see who do I know that's interested in this stuff. And, and that can be very helpful in, in sort of organizing your approach. Um, the local communities. Okay, well now that that one we know about. There's your your your. Very you your slides. You are, sorry, are my slides not are my slides not visible. Right. I seem to have dropped off then. When did they drop off? Oh, they never showed up, I think. That's why I found one comment on the events page uh, mentioning about these slides. I'll share again. Looks like it did drop off. Ah, oh, there we go. So sorry. Thank you for interrupting. And my apologies. Uh, the slide deck will be posted, so you can you can catch up on the stuff that you didn't see. Um, the the local communities are are things like, uh, of course, there's the, there's your things network uh, local group, um, and it's it's critical to have at least one or two other people involved as early as possible. Um, uh, there are affinity groups, and and some I've listed here some of the affinity groups that I find um, um, helpful um, in terms of spreading the word. There's that every community has a has an amateur radio group. And they're naturals for, for 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 this technology and for for this mission. Um, there are IoT meetups because of the the bubble in IoT. There are typically almost everywhere you go, there are people who who have heard about IoT and who are interested. Um, in larger cities, you'll have embedded systems related meetups. Um, you'll have student groups um, at, at the local universities, at the local high schools. You'll have robotics groups. You'll at the at, at, at the high schools often, at, even also at the universities. You'll have uh, perhaps embedded systems. You'll have engineering groups if you've got an engineering school and so forth. Maker spaces, incubators. There may be also think about industry specific meetups where you know that that industry ought to have interest. Agriculture is a big one. As, as people keep saying at the meetings I go to this week, farmers are natural tinkerers. They're often early adopters of technology, and LoRaWAN is really, really very good for farmers. Even if you're doing urban agriculture, there's just lots of things you can do, and you'll get lots of, of people interested, and you'll get some energy. Um, there are some applications in, in medical. Um, we're seeing that in, in New York City, where some large organizations are looking at, at, at the Things Network for not healthcare, but but infrastructure management in medical. Because if you're running a large hospital, the infrastructure is is pretty um, substantial. Um, a lot of environmental uh, uses, environmental monitoring uh, uses of, of the Things Network. Uh, uh, you might want to look at some of the um, what you might call advocacy groups. Um, uh, things like um, um, you know think groups that are encoding minorities, uh, encouraging minorities to write code, groups that are um, uh, in, uh, advocating community development, uh, community economic development, um, relocalization communities, these kinds of things. Local businesses are part of your community. Some of them will be interested in this. Um, local education, um, it, we've gotten a huge amount of help um, just with, with them out without them spending much money from the City University of New York. Uh, they've, they've contributed an intern who's been instrumental in doing uh, some of the some of the work that we've been doing in, in developing the New York City community. Local government, um, you know, in a smaller community, it's pretty easy to reach the people in your local government and get them interested. In a in a city like New York City, you know, you sort of have to get your act together first, and, and, and so you know that that's a, you have to judge in all of these things. You know, what's your best approach? Um, there's also local regional offices of global businesses. This can be very fruitful. You know, if I'm thinking of things like IBM Zurich, who've been key in development of the of the technology, and, and it's, I don't think it's an accident that Zurich is is a big area for for uh, the things that work. Um, KPMG has been very important um, in supporting the development of the of the network. They're in they're in Amsterdam. They're in New York City, and you know there are other places, and so they they might be someone to approach. Um, global communities. Well, of course, there's the TTN group, and you should take advantage of that. Um, you can work with uh, with with Rishi and 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 his colleagues, and and um, 
and they will give you lots of ideas and help and and uh, and, and support. There are the forums. Um, in addition to the global stuff, though, there is some other stuff you should think about. You should you should be working with the Twitter uh, community because the Twitter group, the, the the Twitter world right now, the IoT hashtag is extremely fruitful for finding out what's going on in the Internet of Things and extremely useful for getting the word out about what you're doing. So um, I have been, you know, actually fairly surprised by, by how well Twitter has been working for, for our groups on this. Um, I found they have made a number of connections that way. Um, uh, global businesses, um, you know, that this is, you know, you try to hook up with people like Semtech, uh, um, if, if what you're doing is interesting, you try to hook up with people like Multitech if you're using their stuff, um, uh, microchip. Um, global media, um, and, you know, global media, it's, it's hard as a local group to really do. This is an area where you want to be thinking about it, and if you have an opportunity, of course, do it. But really, the global media, this is something that, that, that TTN Global is doing, and, and they have a better position for doing it because they're talking about it from the global perspective. Um, the global communities, but you should follow what's going on in the global. This is a part, an important input for you from, from community. Um, global trade associations, again, this is an important input for you, you know, following what IETF, following uh, Laura Wayne Alliance, getting involved with Laura Wayne Alliance to the degree that your budget allows. Um, but there's a, there are a lot of resources there. But finally, there's the, the regional communities. Um, and um, the, uh, um, this is important, um, and, and it's an area where you as an initiator uh, need to go find the other initiators in your region and work with them to help develop this. Because this is a, a, an area of, of, uh, where there's a, a real positive benefit if you can play this correctly. And it's also an area where, where, um, where there's not yet sort of a regional organization. Um, so, the, the, by regions, I mean the United States. I mean the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so your 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 local political unit that's bigger than where you're trying to set up the network and so forth. Media is an important area. This is where you know if, if you're in the United States, um, a lot of the United States media is is not global in nature, and so that's an area where you as a as a regional initiator or working with other local initiators. Can, can do some work to get attention. And finally, there are our trade events. So let's talk about the rough patches so I can finish up and let you, then we can get to the questions. Um, so th this slide is, is the good news, the rough patches that we solved. Um, I had really, I had terrible trouble getting good coverage from the gateway in my New York City office, and this affected my confidence in the technology. And this was resolved by, by the, the local community doing tests, which convinced me that this was my problem, not the technology's problem. And this was confirmed when we installed a second gateway in better location. So another rough patch. We had trouble getting endpoints working on US 915 with over-the-air uh, authentication. And this affected my confidence in being able to give the technology to the community adopters. It's one thing to give this to engineers. I mean, since my... Since my strongly felt uh, idea is that I want to give this to the community beyond the engineering community, it was really important to me that I feel positive that we could you know, deploy the technology and that people could get on to solving their problem without dealing with the details. And OTAA is a very important part of that. And when it wasn't working, I was extremely discouraged. But this got solved because we worked on it. And, 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 and you know, uh, MCCI and, and CUNY, you know, did my company's MCCI and, and CUNY did, did some work on this and got it to the point where, where we felt good about that. Um, third thing was that other people didn't share my strongly felt idea. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, I, I'd tell people it's what I want to do and they'd say, oh, yeah, well, that's interesting. And that was solved by inviting others to come speak, especially here at Ithaca, getting Here Lab to come speak. Patrick Phillips um, come speak, you know, electronically to a meeting of the group. You know, he came in and he articulated not just an idea, but he's actually acted on an idea similar to mine and gotten it to fruition with the LoRaWAN technology. And so that suddenly means that I'm, it's not just me. You've got backup from other people. You've got people who are ahead of you who say, oh, yeah, this is doable. This isn't just um, soap that, that some crazy guy is selling. 
So um, rough patches too. So um, these are the things we haven't solved yet, and this is an example of the kind of things that you'll constantly have to work with as you go through your, your community development. Um, we don't have a good answer when, when people ask, is there a literature package? Um, you know, we can point people at web links, but there's nothing coherent uh, for the, the, that I feel that I can give people who are not technically um, uh, deeply educated. Um, people who are deeply educated but not technical um, are actually my target, and, and I don't have anything for them. Um, we're working on that. Um, the second rough patch is that not enough gateways are deployed yet. Um, you know, we, you can't really do a, a, an interesting application in either of my communities because there just isn't enough coverage. Um, some of that, you know, some of that has been held up because we needed better installation instructions for, for my audience. So, and I, this was to build my confidence in asking people to go do this. Um, we needed a success kit um, so that the, the smart non-technical people, when they got their gateway and set it up, they could immediately do something with it and see that it's working. Um, uh, we've got now got a prototype that, that I've developed with, with my company. Um, we need exciting evidence that, that this works to motivate others. And, and that's happening with the, the site scans that we've been doing both in Ithaca and in New York and in Ithaca, and also with you know, talking to people like Patrick Phillips and Pierre Lemon. And the last thing, of course, is that the not solved yet is, is being patient. You know, um, in the technology world, you tend to want, like, you want to see it now. You want to see something happening, and you get frustrated when stuff just takes a while. Um, but, and, you know, you just still need to just keep transmitting the strongly felt idea to others and, and, and help convert that to action. There are a bunch of resources on this slide which... Um, um, which you can use if you want to build on the work that we've done. One of the things that, that the New York and Ithaca groups have, have, have really felt strongly about is we want to make this possible, to, to take what we learn and, and, and make it possible for other people to build on it. And um, so we're, we're very uh, eager to get um, uh, questions from people and, and uh, um, to try to help the next stage of, of communities and, and to, to sort of build, to build a, a kit to help people do this. We've got some of this ready. Some of it we, we may have forgotten to, to, to write stuff down or it's in personal notes and we have to get it on the GitHub. When people ask is typically when it happens. One thing I want to uh, I want to be you know, I want to tell you out of personal experience you want to be very careful when you're choosing images to, to put up on a website um, because um, uh, you can get you, it, can, you, it can be an expensive mistake if you get an image that you can't back up your claim that, that it's it, you've got the rights to put it on your website. Um, people like Getty are always looking for they're using automated tools they're scanning websites they're looking for for misappropriated images and if they if you have an image that you don't have a, a valid license to use it can get really expensive if it's one of Getty's images. So um, a, a second thing on branding. Um, uh, there are, a, if you haven't done this before, follow the standard guidebooks on sizing and formatting your images for each one of the, the places where you're putting your images. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting, I look around um, and it's a, a, a common thing that, that, that people who, who are setting this stuff up and doing lots of different things they don't think about, well I got to resize this and, and make it exactly right to make it look good on the screen. Um, that's it. So I want to say thank you very much for uh, for your attention and for listening, and, and uh, thanks to, to the Things Network for setting this up. Awesome, thanks a lot. I'm sure uh, there was some hidden insight about uh, what not to do and what things to do to manage a community, and uh, more on that. I think um, there's one question which uh, I'll be, I have uh, for you, and that is uh, that. How do you see the importance of a use case while building a community? I mean, you've been an initiator of two communities now, and I've seen things around. So how do you see the value of a use case? Well, that's a really, um, that's a really good question. Um, um, it depends to a large degree on your audience. The, um, the, what I have found is that some audiences really obsess on the use case and some some don't. Um, the the um, so so um, 
I tr I definitely believe in in what uh, uh, at our last at the last uh, webinar the TTM webinar uh, the the presentation slide said you know nobody ever you know it's like you know come up with a use case and I'll build a network you know that's not how it works um, um, or come up with a hypothetical network and I'll build a use case typically the way things really work in engineering is that you have to get people something they can work with before the use cases will start to happen. But you still have to solve the problem of helping people imagine what this might be. So you have to you have to have some reason for people to get excited about this. And and non-technical people um, may not have the faith that technical people that that the that the use cases will will just come automatically out of this. They're, 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 or they may you know get crazy ideas about what the use cases might be if you don't come up with with um, with grounded, uh, well-grounded use cases. There's a fine line to walk between being, between, um, you know, be between, you know, giving people some detail and 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 getting 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 lost in the details. It's very important to sort of say, well, look, you know, there are use cases. Here are some use cases um, from various other sites. Um, um, the the uh, the main thing to bear in mind is that the use cases may not be very compelling to your local community. You know, I mean, at one example of a use case that that is that 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 is great in some communities and not great in other communities is the um, the, the the Amsterdam lead use case of uh, monitoring water in boats. Um, that I think is a great use case, um, uh, and in Ithaca. People think that's a great use case because you know Ithaca's got a big lake and there are people who've got boats and, and so it's and, and and it's a sort of democratic activity. In New York City, boating is not really a democratic activity, and so talking about that use case doesn't fit with my um, with my strongly felt idea that this is a profoundly democratic technology. And that, that the reason I want to do it is for reasons of, of equity. Um, so um, if, if I were to, you know, in, in New York, if you start talking about something that makes life good for voters, you get pigeonholed. And, and, and you don't want to get pigeonholed. So, so you need to choose your use case there. In, in New York, we tend to talk about trash cans. You know, and, you know, the, the, you know when a trash can gets full, you know, the, 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 you know that you have to go empty it instead of sending somebody around on a schedule to empty all the trash cans whether they need to be emptied or not. So every city is different and the use case for every city um, has to be somewhat different. That's why you want to have as soon as you can a, a, a core group of two or three people that you can bounce ideas off of and come up with some straw man use cases. Those might not be what you pilot but but they will be enough to give start getting the next round of people that come into your group thinking along the same lines as how you're thinking. Awesome, uh, Chris. Uh, I have one more question for you, and uh, I think uh, being the community manager, I've uh, faced this question uh, too many times. And the question is that a lot of people uh, are looking to initiate a community at this side, but they're not really well versed with the technical side of things. And so what's going, what's your advice for them to get started and kind of get some education on that part? Uh, great, great question, Rish. Well, at the risk of being um, a bit of an evangelist, I, I recommend that people look into amateur radio. Now, this is if you're interested in radio beyond just the Things Network. Uh, if you're just looking to work on the Things Network and you have a very specific use case, uh, it would be quite a distraction. But if you want to learn more about the uh, about RF, um, how to design antennas, and get a really uh, a, a gut feeling for how the technology works, uh, amateur radio is an amazing resource. So at least here in the states, uh, you can get a license for fifteen dollars for ten years, and you have to take a simple knowledge test. But then you're allowed to operate on many different frequency bands with up to fifteen hundred watts of power. And there's a whole community of people, largely from a previous generation, who experiment with this all the time. And uh, it was actually the amateur radio community that um, discovered a lot of the propagation characteristics and developed many of the modes 
that we use today um, for, for communication. So that is a, a great resource there, both the, the documentation that's been written for amateur radio, but really speaks to radio in general, and just that community, as Terry mentioned, tapping into those people and connecting them with IoT uh, has been really valuable for me. Personally, I knew very little about RF, I was scared of it prior to getting into amateur radio, and now I, f I feel very confident about it and have this gut feeling. So that's the first place that I'd look um, if people are interested in radio more broadly. Awesome. Thanks, Chris, for the uh, answer. Uh, Terry, I have one more question from Mohammed here on the Google Events page. And he says, uh, have you guys ever faced any trouble from the government or any law enforcement in terms of creating a network for public use, wherein uh, people are not paying any fees and they cannot control or monitor it? Well, that's a good question. We, we, we worry about that. Um, you know, um, it, it, we worry about that in the form of the, in the United States, we worry about that in the form of the question, you know, what do we do when the bad guys figure out how to use this network to do something bad? You know, so, so, you know, that was like, that question was asked, I think, at our first group meetup. Um, the thing is that, that, you know, in the United States, um, uh, the, the political situation is still such that, that um, um, we're pretty free uh, to go do this kind of experimentation, and it's, it's sort of... Uh, you don't have to prove in advance that you're going to do no harm. Um, the uh, the in other countries, you know, that's a, a, a bigger consideration, and you have to look at your local at your local uh, situation. I've heard from people in many different countries who are doing this. Some of them are are fairly uh, are much more strictly regulated in the United States, and and it's not. Um, you know, it's it's not such a. They don't have the. They don't. They don't seem to feel the concern. Um, you know, I mean, there's a the things network is deployed in. Uh, is in, is it uh, Wainan, right? Uh, in in China, um, and uh, it's deployed in um, um, uh, a number of of South American countries with with di different levels of of legal system and so forth. I think that the um, the the real the real thing to say is you know what can you do with LoRaWAN that you couldn't do with Wi-Fi, and the answer is not really much. I mean if you're if you're a bad guy, um, Wi-Fi is uh, much easier to work with, and there's lots more ways that you can you can use it. Um, uh, and uh, cellular is even you know even more broad, broad spread. You know, and there's lots of ways that you can use it and misuse it. Laura doesn't really. You know, Laura makes is much more economical, in, but that those economies really only apply if you're doing thousands upon thousands of things. And a, a bad guy is not going to be able to deploy thousands upon thousands of nodes without getting noticed. You know, that's just not really sort of a. a, a it's not a likely attack scheme. You know, what's more likely is that they'll be, you know, doing you know. A small group doing something small but 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 major, and uh, and so um, so from a reasonableness point of view, I think that it's 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 reasonable to say that Laura is not really making things any worse. Um, from a regulatory point of view, of course, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is something that somebody decides, not not that's and it's not necessarily based on. Logic and evidence—it's based on on emotions and 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 feelings, and and you have to work with that. Um, one good thing to tell people I, that you know is like the data is doubly encrypted, um, um, which means that that uh, there's less opportunity for somebody to, to put in a, a bad gateway and and do something bad because they can't really they can they can. They can't really easily prevent other gateways from from being able to forward the data, even if they don't forward the data. And and because of the encryption, it's hard for them to inject traffic. Um, you know, at this point, you're on to second order kinds of things that every network every network has to worry about. So so um, uh, I don't know if I've answered the question. I hope you're posting follow up questions if I'm like off in the off in the weeds about what you're worried about. Awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Terry, for answering the question. Um, so I think uh, this is uh, 
now almost time uh, that we come to the end of the session. It was, I think, great uh, meeting Terry and Chris. Uh, Chris was regarding the technical side of things, and I'm sure a lot of people would have uh, understood things which they probably wouldn't know about. And uh, Terry, thanks a lot again for uh, sharing your experience and sharing the things that uh, people should do or shouldn't do. So it was great catching up with uh, both of you as well. Uh, for everyone else, uh, you can still post your questions on the Google Events page. Uh, Terry, myself, and Chris will keep an eye out, and we'll answer them uh, on the page itself. And for uh, everyone else, uh, we'll be continuing the series every couple of weeks. So watch out on social media and uh, the newsletter. We'll post a date and session for the next webcast soon. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the session, and uh, enjoy the weekend, everyone. I will see you later. Bye-bye.